Let's now look at the conditional, also known as material implication, which we express in English through the use of if, then. It's a compound sentence that contains two parts, an antecedent that follows the if and a consequent that follows the then. So it looks like this, if followed by the antecedent, then followed by the consequent. Here's another video from Professor Delaplante that lays out the truth table for the conditional. He uses a different symbol for the conditional, but it functions the same as our horseshoe. Conditionals are claims of the form, if A is true, then B is true. Here's a conditional. If I miss the bus, then I'll be late for work. It's composed of two separate claims. I miss the bus and I'll be late for work. The conditional claim is telling us that if the first claim is true, then the second claim is also true. We have names for the component parts of a conditional. The first part, the claim that comes after the if, is called the antecedent of the conditional. The second part, the claim that comes after the then, is called the consequent of the conditional. The names are a bit obscure, but they do convey a sense of the role that, that the claims are playing. But antecedes is what comes before. The consequent is a consequence of what has come before. The names are handy to know because they're used in translation exercises where you're asked to express a bit of natural language as a conditional. And they're used to identify the most common logical fallacies that are associated with conditional arguments. One of these fallacies, for example, is called affirming the consequent. You commit this fallacy when you're given a conditional like this and assume from the fact that I was late for work that I must have missed the bus. You're affirming the consequent and trying to infer the antecedent. This is an invalid inference, and the name for the fallacy, which you'll find in any logic or critical thinking textbook, is affirming the consequent. It's pretty easy to understand what conjunctions and disjunctions assert. It's not quite as easy seeing exactly what it is that you're asserting when you assert a conditional. Here's a conditional. If I drive drunk, then I'll get into a car accident. Question, if I assert that this is true, am I asserting that I'm driving drunk? No, I'm not. Am I asserting that I'm going to get into a car accident? No, I'm not asserting that either. What I assert, when I assert if A then B, I'm not asserting A and I'm not asserting B. What I'm asserting is a conditional relationship, a relationship of logical dependency between A and B. I'm saying that if A were true, then B would also be true. But I can say that without asserting that either A or B is in fact true. It follows that a conditional can be true even when both the antecedent and the consequent are false. Here's an example. If I live in Beijing, then I live in China. I don't live in Beijing, and I don't live in China. So both the antecedent and the consequent are false. But this conditional is clearly true. If I did live in the city of Beijing, I would live in China. In a minute, we'll look at the truth table for the conditional, which gives you the truth value of the conditional for every possible combination of truth values of A and B. The easiest way to understand the truth table is to think about the case where we would judge a conditional to be false. Here's one. If I study hard, then I'll pass the test. Now, under what conditions would we say that this conditional claim is false? Well, let's consider some possibilities. Let's say I didn't study hard, but I still passed the test. Here, the antecedent is false, but the consequent is true. In this case, would the conditional have been false? Well, no. The conditional could still be true in this case. What it says is that if I study hard, then I'll pass. It doesn't say that the only way I'll pass is if I study hard. So my failing to study hard and still passing doesn't falsify the conditional. This combination of truth values does not make the conditional false. Now, what about this case? I didn't study hard and I didn't pass the test. Here, both the antecedent and the consequent are false. This clearly doesn't falsify the conditional. If anything, this is what you might expect would happen if the conditional was true and the test was hard. So this combination of truth values doesn't make the conditional false either. So let's look at a third case. I studied hard, but I didn't pass the test. Here, the antecedent is true, but the consequent is false. Now, under these conditions, could the conditional still be true? Well, no, it can't. These are the conditions under which a conditional is false. When the antecedent is true, but the consequent turns out to be false. If I studied hard and didn't pass, this is precisely what the conditional says won't happen. So, in general, a conditional is false just in case the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. This turns out to be the only case where we want to say with certainty that a conditional claim is false. All other combinations of truth values are consistent with the conditional being true. This now gives us the truth table for the conditional. 
For the sake of consistency and familiarity with the truth tables for the conjunction and the disjunction, I place the arrow symbol in between the A and the B to represent the conditional operator, where A arrow B means if A then B. The conditional asserts that if A is true, then you can infer B. It doesn't go the other way. It doesn't say that if, you, if B is true, then you can infer A. Notice that the second row gives the only combination of truth values that makes the conditional false when A is true and B is false. For all other combinations, the conditional counts as true. Now this definition doesn't always give intuitive results about how to interpret language that uses conditionals, but for purposes of doing propositional logic, it gets it right in all the cases that matter. Conditionals are extremely important in the sciences, where they play a central role in hypothesis formation. Here's an example. If salt water exists on Mars, then microbial life exists there. This is clearly hypothetical. How would we test it? Well, we've got the data from Curiosity rover, the NASA vehicle that collected myriad soil and atmospheric samples since 2012. Let's examine the possibilities by testing our hypothesis within the context of the truth table for conditional statements. The antecedent for our hypothesis is the claim that salt water exists on Mars. The consequent is that microbial life exists there. So we'll express this by saying if S, then L, symbolically notated as S horseshoe L. According to the truth table for the conditional, the only instance in which the hypothesis would be disproven or falsified is in the second row where it's true that water exists on Mars, but false that there is microbial life. If that's the case, then the hypothesis needs to be reworked, since the hypothesis posits that the presence of salt water implies the presence of microbial life. But what if the rover fails to detect salt water, but finds microbial life, as in the third row of the truth table? And how about the fourth row, where Rover supposedly finds neither salt water nor microbial life? Wouldn't those two rows disconfirm the hypothesis? Not at all. The hypothesis still stands. If salt water exists on Mars, then microbial life exists there. The instances in which we did not find salt water but did detect microbial life, the third row, and in which we found neither that is, the fourth row does not affect the hypothesis, since it only claims that the presence of salt water on Mars implies microbial life. So the only time our hypothesis is disconfirmed is in the second row, where S is true and L is false. So here's our rule for the conditional. A conditional sentence is false if and only if its antecedent is true and its consequent is false. Otherwise, it's true. Let's add one more general observation about conditionals. We've discussed the distinction between sufficient and necessary conditions in a previous lecture, specifically Unit 5.1. A necessary condition is a condition that must be present for an event to occur. A sufficient condition is a condition or set of conditions that will, in and of itself or themselves, produce the event. A necessary condition must be there, but it alone does not provide sufficient cause for the occurrence of the event. Only the sufficient grounds can do this. Here's an example. Electrocution is sufficient to cause death. However, people can die in many other ways, and therefore electrocution is not necessary to cause death. In any conditional sentence, the antecedent expresses a sufficient condition for the consequent, and the consequent, a necessary condition for the antecedent. Thus, another way of saying if A then B is to say that A is sufficient for B and B is necessary for A. If I assert that if Maria is a practicing attorney, then she's passed the bar exam, that means that Passing the bar exam is a necessary condition for practicing law, and that being a practicing lawyer is a sufficient condition for having passed the bar exam, in the sense that the former is a guarantee for the latter. It's important to appreciate the relationship between sufficient and necessary conditions in conditional sentences, because it helps us properly order the antecedent and the consequent in cases where it might get tricky. Take the following example. 
Maria is a practicing lawyer only if she has passed the bar exam. Here, we might be tempted to translate this into sentential logic with the following. If Maria passed the bar exam, then she is a practicing lawyer. But that would be mistaken. The locution only if clearly indicates that what follows is a necessary condition. As a result, only if introduces the consequent. Of course, if taken by itself would still introduce the antecedent. Next up in this unit, we'll take a look at the biconditional.